Now I'm just going to give you a couple of examples around what we've learned from this social marketing approach and how it's informed our work. The first one is around, I think I've just talked about this a little bit before, it's around the language and the way that the sector wants to talk around family violence and particularly around rights-based language. Now in New Zealand, strangely enough, we don't have a lot of discourse around human rights and, um, and rights-based language for New Zealanders. We definitely talk about it overseas, but we don't talk about it in New Zealand. And so the discussion around um, human rights and around um, violence against women is not, is not big on the um, conversations in New Zealand. And so for um, engaging with New Zealand audiences, a rights-based kind of language, like it is my right to be violence-free, doesn't necessarily work very well because it's not something they're familiar with, it's not something they actually um, can connect with, and it's not something necessarily high on what they care about. So even though we know this about um, human rights approach, and even though we feel it and we know it's right, it isn't necessarily the right way to communicate with our audiences in New Zealand. However, it is right for some com communities. So we've found that, especially for refugee survivor communities, that um, speaking from a human rights-based framework does work because they've been familiar with the rights-based conversation before they came to New Zealand. And it is something that um, they connect with and understand and care about. And so for particular communities that's worked well, but generally for the New Zealand population, we've steered away from um, framing up our conversations around violence prevention in that kind of human rights framework. It doesn't mis mean that the campaign's not informed by that or that we're not holding on to that understanding, but we're trying to translate that understanding into something that works with audiences. So it's always this kind of balance between keeping our analysis around power and gender and violence um, and human rights in there, but how do we communicate that in a way that audiences will understand? And it's up to you to think about, you know, how does that, do you think that works? Uh, um, is what we're doing keeping to that framework enough and allowing our audiences to understand that or I'd be really interested to hear your feedback about that. So I think the term family violence relates to that quite well because you would have noticed that we're not talking about violence against women and partly that's because of the New Zealand political context. We don't have legislation around violence against women. It's not a common term that's used here. Strangely enough, compared to all the other countries that we like to compare ourselves to, um, Fam violence against women is not a concept that's used much in New Zealand. So we talk about family and domestic violence. We talk about sexual violence a, a bit separately. We talk about forced marriage um, only just recently and um, sexual harassment in the workplace. And um, uh, But they're all quite disconnected and there's not anything that's connecting them up unlike Australia and the UK and in Canada where there are um, strategies and policies and groups that are framing up violence against women approach. And I, 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 within the New Zealand context, I, I think that's not a great thing. I think we definitely do need a better understanding around violence against women and the intersectionalities of violence. Um, in terms of the campaign though, I think the term family violence has actually worked quite well. So this is a, it's a um, less threatening, it's um, something that everyone can relate to. It helps people um, take it, see it as something personally relevant to them. And um, it helps us get into a conversation where previously people would have put the barriers up and said, no, that's not about me, that's nothing to do with me. So I think in terms of the social marketing campaign, the term family violence and family violence, it's not okay, has worked really well. But um, I don't know, I don't think it's necessarily useful when you're trying to work in the sector and you're trying to get an understanding of the different forms of violence. I think there, family violence doesn't necessarily work that well and we do need to unpick it and talk more about intimate partner abuse and child abuse and how they're different and how they overlap. Um, so it's not necessarily a useful term for practice, but I think it has been very good for a social marketing approach as a first level, a first step in. So if, to engage people in a conversation, then you can get them to help 
um, into a deeper conversation and you can help them understand more about family violence. And so that's when we would build in an understanding around gender and power um, and inequalities there. So you might see that a lot of our language is gender neutral or doesn't have um, he or she in the language, if that's what I mean by gender neutral, so that it can relate to all forms of violence and so that it can relate to all audiences. But then you will see that a lot of our advertising and a lot of our images and our messages are definitely informed by a gender analysis around violence and around a power analysis. And so we've kind of kept that underlying as a second level underneath the family violence. It's not okay it is okay to ask for help messages um, I also think it's important that we have taken um, with the social marketing approach a really positive and inspiring and um, hopeful approach around preventing violence so we've always talked about the campaign as being um, in the space where light and dark meet and that it's really important in terms of the dark to name the issue the serious issue about family violence and help people understand what it is and help people talk about it but we always have to take that somewhere there always has to be hope that there's a better life hope for a life without violence we have to be positive and inspiring and encouraging for behavior change so we've definitely not wanted to take a shaming and blaming approach. We've always tried to have the light there to show that just because things have happened in people's past doesn't mean it's gonna be like that in the future. Just because our community has violence now doesn't mean we can't change it and live violence free. So we think it's been really important to keep that balance and always keep it ending on hope, change, inspiration, um, support. And that's very different from some of the traditional social marketing messages which are around family violence is a crime, you'll go to jail, you know, focusing on the really serious, heavy part of um, violence prevention. I think, um, yeah, I'm just not sure whether those messages, we've tried them in New Zealand, I just don't think that they worked to engage anyone at all, actually. I think that um, starting gently, showing that change is possible, that's been what has really engaged lots of New Zealanders in the conversation about family violence and helping them see that it's to do with everyone. Um, I also think we, uh, our social marketing approach has been um, different and controversial in the way that we're focused around men changing their behaviour. And that was quite hard for me at the beginning because I was working in the, um, you know, women's refuge, working with uh, women, victim, women and children victims of violence. And to see that there was going to be a well-funded campaign and it was focusing on men immediately got lots of us thinking about why isn't that money going into victims? Why isn't that going into um, support for victims? And I really changed my thinking about it after the first few months and I understand why the campaign decided to do that so they used um, research to look around and figure out what was currently happening in New Zealand around preventing violence and realise that the big gap was focusing on men who are using violence and if we really want to shift preventing violence if we really want to prevent violence and shift um, attitudes and behaviours. This is one of the key audiences that we need to engage with because these are the people who are using violence. We can keep on focusing on victims forever but they're not able to stop the violence and whatever we do there is not going to stop men using violence. So we think it's been really important to have this as one of the many parts that's happening across the community um, to engage men and think about how can we shift men's behaviour so that they no longer use violence and how can we shift other men's behaviour so that they support men to stop using violence. That, that was quite a hard conversation with the domestic violence sector at the time. I think a lot of people didn't understand why that was going to happen but I think that's definitely shifted now. After a few years people have seen the huge benefits of many more men feeling comfortable talking about violence, many more men self-referring to programs, um, owning up to their own behaviour, sharing their stories of, um, be, of surviving um, violence as a child and then going on to use violence and just being comfortable to talk with violence um, to their mates and even challenge their behaviour. So I think that's really um, shifted New Zealand conversations and communities, but it was very hard at the beginning 
to um, to see the work happening um, for men rather than for victims. But I think that's been one of the things that's really made a difference.